as a sign of its importance, the general consensus that has been expressed today and um, the positive aspects of the bill which have been highlighted by all, uh, including those aspects which were developed out of the collaborative process of the Joint Select Committee. And uh, we therefore once again thank all members of that committee who clearly uh, gave their time and commitment to the process and uh, worked effectively to ensure that the document before us now is, uh, is an improved uh, bill beyond what had been presented to the committee originally. Um, Mr. President, just to make a few points uh, that were raised and to address uh, a few of the issues that were uh, asked in, in the debate. Uh, there was, for example, the query regarding how soon the bill will come into effect, a matter which I touched on in my opening, uh, addressing the issue of the use of the two-year period, which is a transition period com um, created within the statute itself, and the fact that uh, the intention now on passage of the bill will be to seek the approval of Ministry of Finance for the structure and accordingly the posts. So that process, which is not as um, necessarily a swift process, it's one that, ha one that has to take place in the context of public sector transformation, and it's quite a rigorous assessment that is gone through by the Ministry of, of Finance uh, based on the work that has already been done with the consultancy. So, so soon as the bill is passed, they will start that process. It's anticipated that when that process is completed, they can start the recruitment process to establish the office and accordingly it would be budgeted for in 2021. So that's the plan. The plan is not to, um, is not to seek to um, overleap but to go through the process and ensure that 2021 uh, we're ready to have the office properly established. Recruiting will already have been um, extensively progressed if not completed, allowing for the um, the next stage to be taken expeditiously. Uh, Mr. President, I know that one point that has come out quite clearly in this process is the need for public education. So it is anticipated that during this transition period, uh, it will be treated as a, a, an appropriate period for public education prior to the coming into effect of the bill. So we wouldn't pass the bill and educate people as we go through in this event. We actually get the benefit of time, um, a nice run-up where people will understand the bill when it, is, when it has come into effect. And this is important. Uh, it's important, the point has been made that no one should be left behind, whether it is the old lady in, I can't remember if it was Moko that she was identified from or, or, <laughs> or um, cross keys or cross, <laughs> what is other cross? <laughs> but um, but it really, this is where we, we, we can promote the positives of this bill and indeed the positives of NIDS as well when it shall, shall have come into effect. Because, I mean, I recall speaking with my counterparts from Kenya and from India about the processes in place and how it is, and they, when you consider some of the comparable populations that are dealt with, deep rural, varying levels of literacy, varying levels of access, and in their cases, sometimes far more disparate, far more um, marginalized than even in Jamaica, which is, is um, a much smaller community, even when you consider that everything is relative. And, you know, when you're told about the grandmothers who now only use mobile pay and how they think it's fantastic, it's a function of the empowerment brought by education, by public education to engage. But it is that, that positive side of things, the access that it brings, instead of always focusing on the negative and the fear about disenfranchisement and, dis and, and marginalization, I think when you look at the impact, the positive benefit that can come from the services 
and the protection that will be given by this bill, then we will get further and faster and we will have greater engagement and buy-in because we will focus on the positives. The amount of corruption that has been cut out in these countries because of how the money is paid and where it is paid. When we think about the issues with pension payments and how that needs to be digitized, that process being underway, these are things that help people, that help the marginalized, that help those persons who, are, um, who live in rural areas and who have otherwise um, less access to service. It makes access to services better. And that is something that we should always remember the enabling power of technology and the legislation that we're passing. Uh, uh, to, to feed the fear is unhelpful to the development of society. So it really, it really is, it really is important to ensure that we focus on the benefits. So not that not that questions shouldn't be asked and not that suggestions can't be made, but the point is that there are many benefits. They don't marginalize. They often engage and provide greater access, and that, I think, is a point that should not be missed. Mr. President, we had uh, members of the Senate today speaking about uh, implications for workplace, implications for health, uh, the implications of um, or the, rather the ability and enablement of persons to truly embrace a digital future with the protection that is brought um, by, these bill, by the bill before us. And all of this, again, the protections brought thereby are balanced with the recognition that there is a provision for review such that there are where elements, if elements are found to be problematic, although they now appear workable and have been so found by the Joint Select Committee that they can be reviewed at that stage. So you have an opportunity to, um, to adjust as you go along. Um, but just to answer some of the questions that have been raised, uh, there was a question of the health professional uh, and uh, where it is community aids would, would fall and, and similar, uh, similar personnel. So the, the nurse, the porter, um, they, they are employees of persons at 2G and F, and certainly the, um, the broad provision at F, I've said G and H, pardon me, and certainly um, the provisions at F would help to, to broaden uh, and, and include all the persons that you have named. So it wouldn't, we wouldn't need to name those additional uh, personnel. In the definition of personal data, uh, concern was raised about the 30-year period, and this was uh, what was agreed by the Joint Select Committee as provided in Section 10 of the Archives Act, and the intention was to capture, ensure that you capture a generation. Um, I'm noting as well that there is to be a small ad adjustment and amendment that will be made to personal data, uh, the definition in two, and that is simply to move up the words means information, however stored, that will directly follow from personal data, and then so that it will qualify both A, relating to one, a living individual, two, an individual who has, and B, includes. So the only change is to remove the words means information, however stored, from A. This is section two, clause two. Page five, and it is um, the definition of personal data. Just lifting from, pa um, from paragraph A, the words means information, however stored, lifting it into the chapeau and continuing with A starting at relating to. Uh, also in clause two, in paragraph C, the definition of public authority, uh, we will be removing the words council of in that precede local authority, so that the definition will actually be that it's the local authority, all aspects of it, and not simply the council. Uh, Mr. President, there was a question uh, regarding at the absence of a timeline in 4.8, and it has been uh, indicated that the proposal 
uh, should not be accepted at this time, that Section 9 of the Interpretation Act applies such that where no time is prescribed or allowed for anything to be done, the thing shall be done with all convenient speed and as often as the prescribed occasion arises. So um, it wasn't uh, anticipated that it could be problematic if you set a timeline here rather than to allow the general statutory framework to be used. In Clause 9, uh, there was a recommendation made that consent uh, should be given at the point when the data subject was strongest and not weakness, and that it shouldn't be made subject to the provision of goods or services. And um, this, we would just direct attention of the Senate to Clause 9.2b, which provides that consent is not freely given if the data subject is required as a condition of the provision of any goods or service to the data subject. Um, to consent to the collection, use, or disclosure of the data, um, of the data subject's personal data beyond what's reasonable. So it's already dealt with there. It's just in the, um, it's in the paragraph just above, 9.2b, and that's how it works together. In respect of clauses 30, sub 7, and 52.4, uh, there was a, a question raised about the absence of custodial provisions. Um, so when the committee cons uh, considered the matter, uh, what was proposed was, uh, was simply that the fines be increased rather than that there be a custodial sentence imposed. Uh, but the issue of the custodial sentence was not raised. Um, so that is something that um, is actually could be considered uh, looking back at the context, so maybe we can discuss that just a little more in committee, uh, the nature of both clauses. Um, and there is also an, an issue about repercussions for breach of clause 37. Um, and what, 37. And the, the response of the technical team is, is that the breach would actually mean that the data controller doesn't fall within the exemption provided for in 37 so that 21.2 would apply. So the breach corrects the, um, the, the protection that's granted by the exemption. So um, I, I hope that that meets with your concern. In respect of the first schedule, uh, the proposal regarding the language, there was in fact um, a need for an amendment there as well. And the, so the use of member, member of, um, of either house will be used for both. Uh, it will be retained for consistency, so that um, was a, a good correction. And uh, in respect <laughs> of paragraph um, 26B, this is an editorial adjustment, but it's one notwithstanding. Um, that is in 26B, the words for any other cause um, needs to go back to the margin of subparagraph 6. That wasn't ma um, made in the debate, but it was r uh, recognized while looking at the uh, issue raised by Senator Skeffrey. Uh, in respect of paragraph 1-6 in part 2, sorry, no, we're at far paragraph 4-1, uh, and this is the issue of the Deputy Commissioner. So the suggestion in relation of in relation to having the deputy commissioner appointed in the same way as a commissioner, the thinking was really that you would have one that goes through the appropriate governance process, uh, in, which involves the political directorate, but to have the deputy uh, the, pro the subject of a pure recruitment process. So you would put your advertisements, you do your interviews, and that the deputy commissioner would be someone who is assessed purely on pro professional capacity, while you would anticipate professional capacity also being a part of the appointment of the, um, of the commissioner. The deputy would now be an entirely technical decision to be taken. The thinking was to not have both appointed by the same process. Um, regarding the first schedule, part two, where paragraph 1-6 was raised about a phasing of appointments in relation to tenure of the committee, um, the, the suggestion is, is not one without merit, but it's not considered feasible at this time, and it's thought that with the, um, that with the periods of time and the best practice that, is, uh, that exists, it's felt that this 
actually suffices. If it is that at a later stage, it might not even be thought that at the point of review that this might need to be changed. But if it is that there is perceived to be a problem, that is something that can be looked at for review. And um, in respect of paragraph five, where the suggestion has been made for the committee to elect one of their members to be deputy chair, um, this suggestion has not been accepted. And this is a general provision that is in most laws. And while that's not never, that's never really a reason to do anything, uh, it is it felt that this had been given an appropriate level of scrutiny and found to be appropriate. In the fifth schedule, paragraph 1.3, there was a suggestion to have a quorum for the tribunal um, sitting. And this one, this suggestion was also not uh, accepted. Uh, the view was that the ministries of the view, rather, that the agreement between parties would operate as the uh, requisite safeguard against any allegation of impropriety. And the fact of, um, of one, the, the fact that our judicial system or judicial process uh, already recognizes the entirely appropriate and effective use of, uh, um, of a body sitting, less than three, one single person making these types of decisions, it was felt that you might actually reduce the effectiveness of the body if you didn't allow someone to be able to consent to how the decisions could be made. But please spread. <laughs> and Senator Crawford is not here to cut and clear today for me. Paragraph two, concern was also raised that the commissioner has a fixed term and the oversight committee rather, but for um, the appeal tribunal. Uh, members were agreed, this actually was discussed in the Joint Select Committee, I'm advised, and members were agreed that the information commissioner was not to hold office for more than two terms, so 14 years, but that different considerations would apply for an appeal tribunal and that the function that it provides vis-a-vis uh, -vis the, the, the commissioner and the oversight, that it would be um, more effective to actually allow continuity in dealing with rights and development of expertise. So they view the, the, the issue as, as somewhat different. One, you're leveraging knowledge and experience, and in the other, you're ensuring that there is sufficient uh, renewal of, their, of, um, of personnel. So in that context, Mr. President, uh, I would ask for second reading of the bill. Thank you. The question members would have heard from the minister is that the bill be read a second time. Those in favor? Against? Madam Clark? entitled an act to protect the privacy of certain data and for connected matters read a second time. The Senate will now resolve itself into a committee of the whole Senate to consider the bill clause by clause. Sorry, President, before you go to committee, could I make an appeal to the Minister if, given all she just said in response, if she would consider postponing committee to next week and we fresh Senator Sophia Fraser being for example who open for us had to leave and when we're fresh we go through it quickly now or oh, so next sitting but some of us I know Senator Morris have to leave shortly some of us are affected by other things so I urge you to put off committee at the next sitting. I pray that you would accept that. Mr. President, the intention had been to pass this bill uh, a couple of weeks ago, and we've postponed the debate 
to allow for more members to participate. We had to postpone the debate because there were other intervening legislative matters. Members today have even complained about the fact that we are a year behind uh, in, in their contributions. So really, really, as had been indicated by the leader of opposition business at an earlier stage of today's sitting, uh, where she had indicated that the work, um, it was important work that lay ahead of us. I would ask that we just harness ourselves, buck up, and push through. Uh, the, the matters have been before us. We have had the bill. It has been the subject of three years' work, including an extremely effective Joint Select Committee with 26 um, contributions uh, in terms of co uh, public consultations made, uh, and that only formally in the Senate, uh, sorry, in the, in the Parliament. I would ask that we, um, that we proceed. It, it really shouldn't be so lengthy, although the bill is, um, is not a, a short bill. There are not that many issues with which we should contend. I hear you, Minister, but ES make bad bills. That's the problem. Minister, as I understand um, your closing, the only aside from the schedule, your amendment proposed is in section clause two. Is that correct? There, there's an amendment, there are two amendments proposed for clause two. Pardon me. There are two amendments proposed for clause two. And there, there is a discussion around Clause 30 and Clause 52 based on a, a, a proposal regarding custodial sentencing. Okay. So well, let, me, let me take Clause 1 and then Clause 2, and I see if we can move to 30 at that time. So I put Clause 1. Those in favor? Aye. Against? Um, clause 2, there is an amendment. Yes, Mr. President. In, in paragraph C of the definition of public authority, uh, it is intended to delete the words council of at the very start of the definition. And in the definition of personal data, it is intended to, uh, well, a, a technical approach has been taken to delete the entire uh, provision and substitute Therefore, the following, personal data means information, in parentheses, however stored, dash, A, relating to, and everything else remains the same. Everything else remains the same, Mr. President. Thank you very much. Members have heard the amendment to Clause 2. Those in favor of the amendment? Aye. Against? I put Clause 2 as amended. Those in favor? Aye. Against? Can I put three? I put clauses three to five. Those in favor? Aye. Against? With the agreement of the Senate, I put clauses five to 13. Those in favor? Seven, seven, I will answer. I have a concern at seven. Oh, I would put clauses three to seven. Six. Three to six. Three to six. Thank you. Those in favor? Against? Clause seven. Yes, sir. At seven one B. It says the data subject agrees otherwise. Is there a time? by which, at which that agreement would be effective. Just assist me, clause, what? Seven, 
1B and page 71D. And page 15. 1B as in boy. Yeah, in other words, the data subject agrees otherwise. And I'm asking that otherwise, could it be at the start of a contract? Could it be, is it at the time of the sharing of the data? This is about the obligation to, com to comply with the obligation, sorry, the obligation to provide a copy, right? And to provide it in permanent form. And it must, this is saying that it must be provided in per permanent form unless the data subject agrees otherwise. So I must get it in a way that it can be received unless I say, I want it otherwise, so give it to me digitally or tell me over the phone, which is quite different. So this is not time bound. This is about the obligation to actually provide it in a form, in a particular form. So it's not a time based issue. Okay, thank you. So I can put clause seven. Those in favor? Against? I put clauses 8 to 13. Those in favor? Aye. Against? Um, I put, this is, this is part 3, so I'll put clauses 14 to 20. Those in favor? Aye. Against? Part four, which is clauses 21. Uh, no, we have an issue at 30, correct? Okay, so I will put clauses 21 to 29. Those in favor? Against? I put clause 30. Right, so this, this uh, provision, Mr. President, in the, in the debate, uh, Senator Skiffrey had asked why a, a custodial sentence would not be imposed in respect of this clause. And it was, uh, I believe, I understand rather at the time that when, it, when the issue of raising the sentence, raising the, um, the fine uh, was discussed, the committee actually considered the provisions of the UK Data Protection Act of 2018, and this particular offense did not actually attract a custodial sentence. Uh, the sense was that, and the discussion was that uh, there being a general movement away from custodial sentences for certain types of offenses. It was felt that this was primarily administrative in its operation and accordingly uh, that it would not attract uh, a custodial sentence. But if Senator feels strongly about it and wanted to discuss it further, I thought uh, that it was one that could be further pursued. No, I just want to clarify, because it's administrative, but the, the, the concern I have here yeah, the fine is, is there the person refused to pay the fine? What's the next alternative? So how would you treat that administratively? That's a clarification then. Because you, you want compliance, and if the person is found guilty, and that's the, the punishment, you want it to be paid. And if the person ignores it, then what? So that is still the, 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 the gap that I see. So how you, how you get compliance, and to ensure that you don't have repeat um, offender. So you, you, I'm charged, pay a fine, charge, give me a fine, I don't pay it, I repeat the offense, then what next? You just continue giving a fine and then you refuse to pay. What's the recourse of the system? I just want some clarity as to how we treat with it. <laughs> so you, it's, it's left hanging. So in, in other words, it will not be forceful and, 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 and the teeth in the law will not be there. Senator Scott, Scott Motley, Senator Brown, Minister, isn't there, wasn't, isn't there a principle that says that there should always be an alternative? 
provision. It came up in the NIDS case uh, when we, we had the same issue which arose. And it was the intervention of Senator Knight who pointed out what in practicality takes place, that the judge has to impose an alternative that led us to putting in the community, that led the government to putting in the community um, service. I have, I'm, I'm looking at it a little differently, and if you look at 21, I'm trying to quickly, because uh, look at 21, which imposes um, a, a custodial sentence for a data controller who processes personal data and contravention, but not only that, or fails to make a report, which is almost, you could say, not, you know, the failure to make, to, to make a report is not at the highest possible level. And yet there is a custodial thing. So I think that, I think it needs to be addressed in practical terms if you go before the court. Well, as you sorry, pointed Senator, out. Sorry, Minister. Senator. I think from memory, I'm oh. not going to put my hand on the block. There's a system of forfeiture when you don't pay fines and there's no alternatives, you know. But of course, you have to have something to forfeit. So that there is a procedure, I'm almost sure. There is. Where you, the, you, the Crown now proceed to forfeit your property if you don't well, pay. I think there's a, the, the guidance is that the Criminal Justice Reform Act would allow for, uh, or rather would mandate a, a custodial sentence as a result. You would have imprisonment for failure to, to pay the fine, and this was a very issue. Not in the NIDS case, but in the debate that took place here, which, um, and the, the position was that if that would happen as a matter of course, then we should indicate what the court should do if that was not it, what was intended, and therefore we had put in the community service as the option. Right, so there would be a custodial sentence that would result from this. But why I thought it could be discussed further was if it, if it was felt strongly, and it does appear that this is the mind, that we could, um, that, I, that I did get language uh, that could allow us to amend, to put in a custodial sentence of not exceeding two years before the parish court and not exceeding 10 years before the circuit, if it is felt. Uh, why I hesitated is because when, if the joint select committee had looked at it and not thought it was appropriate for this particular one, as well as the 52, clause 52, which is the next one to be discussed, then I would be hesitant to add it because were there things considered uh, then, but the, the minute actually doesn't capture a deeper consideration beyond recognition that the fine would be increased and that um, the, the, the precedents that they had looked at had not actually attached a custodial sentence and that accordingly it could be just treated under the normal operation of law. I'm concerned with just what inserting mm -hmm. a custodial sentence because mm -hmm. I know yes. that uh, the, the, mm -hmm. the thinking was that in other jurisdictions it was it not been done. That way. And right. what I'm wondering is if there could be no other, I can't think of anything right now, but if we couldn't approach it in a different way to give effect to what was the thinking. Well, the thinking was to leave it as is, which right, was but to we, but we have Right, but we have already discussed that in the alternative. If there is non, no alternative specified, then the judge has the authority to go to custodial, which is not what was being recommended. No, but I don't think so. I, do, I don't, th sorry, I don't think that if you just leave it, if there is just a fine without an alternative, that's, what that's I'm not saying, giving the judge. That's what I'm saying, Chairman, that we need to insert an alternative that gives, uh, that reflects I, what was the intention. To me, though, I, I would be happy to be guided by the technical persons but I'm almost sure that where there is a fine and there's no alternative, there is a law that requires that your goods be forfeited. I mean... Well, though, Senator, we can't leave it to chance. We would, if, you guide, if you guide a team towards the law, maybe we could just check it now. I can't. Okay. But I know they should know, they will tell us. President, Chairman, Chairman, is mixed race. This is something that
quite correctly, both sides have recognized. They, we don't lose a year if we spend some time over the next, the difference between now and the next sitting, and look at this. So all the other amendments that we have to make, we, we, we give it some extra consideration. I think our, our desire to make good laws run into conflict with ACE. And I urge you again, Minister, I know, I've learned as a man that the first and the second and the third no is not the it's only no. I accept no, but it's not the I accept no, but I must ask again. So, so I urge you, Minister, just take the break of the week, get all the clarification so we can make clear. And don't, don't try and, what I say I respect, no. But I ask again, and I ask again after every no. I don't continue doing what I'm doing other than to make the request. For, so I know no will try to spin something. But I know you'll try. I never see it spinning because you're not successful. But you'll try. But what I'm trying to get, Minister, yeah, what I'm trying to get, Minister, is just we're not going to lose as a country. If we take the break, consult with the technical team some more so we can make laws on which we are certain. But, you, but Minister, you, Senator Brown, with the greatest of respect, the Minister has indicated that she's going to complete the matter. So, the pe people don't change mind? Uh, so, there, what, what, there, what is it that you're going to do with this clause? Yeah, yes, Mr. President, what I'm saying is that there has been, the technical team has provided a, uh, an alternative. They have provided proposed uh, custodial sentences that could be added. Uh, having discussed it and looked back at the nature of the clause, uh, which is why I had flagged it for as the two that could be discussed further in here. But with the greatest of respect, thank you. Yes, Mr. President. So if it is that the, um, that the sense is and the, the guidance has been that although it wasn't treated this way by the UK, uh, that so certainly uh, in and of itself would not suffice for us not to take that position and that it would add clarity given that there is uh, in fact um, that there is in fact uh, harm that could be done as a result of the breach as a result of the offense so if we could take the language uh, but what I would be loath to do is to now try to get creative around it the committee took a position the technical team has looked back at it based on the issue that was raised here. They have proposed a solution as if it is felt that there should be a sentence other than the fine. They have proposed what they would recommend. So I think to now tinker with that is where we would start to develop a problem. The proposal is that for uh, the parish court, it would be the, you would retain the fine not exceeding $2 million and include or to imprisonment for a term not exceeding two years. And in respect of the circuit court, the fine um, or imprisonment for a term not exceeding 10 years. And this would give the court latitude. It's not and, other, what, it's That's or. in keeping with the, with the other yes. provision that Scott Motley made reference to. Yes, Mr. President. So. Put on yes. your mat. Well, what they considered was the, the issue of the fact that the, the data controller would actually have implemented processes that you would have had to willfully breach in order to, to take this action so that there was actually a further uh, in, a, a intentional it's a action. It's a contradiction from going to just a fine to having to go into 10 years. It doesn't, it's not logical. This is why we debate. I would so prefer were we to, to leave agree it as to the seven? I'm not really debating it. I'm just saying it's not logical. You can't move from just saying that it's an administrative breach, which in other jurisdictions is viewed as such that it does not require custodial sentence. Then you go to looking at it 
and making it a higher custodial sentence than for another breach for which there is a custodial sentence. That's what I'm saying. It's just not logical. Chairman, if I was speaking for myself, I, I suppose there was a policy consideration in this matter, and the committee considered it. I am uncomfortable just moving to that hell of a fine a prison, imprisonment to be associated with it when it was the policymakers were comfortable in leaving it as it is. Mr. President, I what would I'd prefer like to, to leave it as is. What I'd like to suggest then, Mr. President, is that we keep it as is and that I raise the matter with the minister for her consideration. If it is that it is deemed to be a, an important amendment, then it can be addressed otherwise. Uh, that then it would ensure that the policy consideration would be taken into, into um, or rather they would have considered the policy and uh, we would not have unnecessarily um, sought to change a matter which had been the subject of debate. What, what I would do is, Leader, since the Leader has obviously stepped out, we, we could come back to 30. Yes, could, let us come back to 30. Uh, I accept what you said in relation to that. So I'm going to come back to 30. So I can put 31. Those in favor? Aye. Against? There is, okay. Um, Senator Scott Motley, we, we are, we're coming back to it. So uh, perhaps you could just explain what your position is so I can put 30. Yes. Ms. <laughs> No, 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 no not, not a problem at all. We were just saying that perhaps given that there are differing views on both sides, uh, Senator Braham having just proposed that the matter stay as is, that given that his concern being that um, the committee having considered the matter and kept it as is, then he would be uh, concerned. What my proposal was therefore that we keep it as is and I will raise it with the minister so that she can, if, it is deemed after her discussions with her technical people, et cetera, that it is, is in fact something that should be addressed, then it can be addressed at the appropriate level and she can take it in that other place rather than address it here. I prefer that recommendation. I don't like the fact that we are just rushing to try and find a solution. I know that based on my experience at the Joint Select Committee, uh, the technical team would have considered it before making such a recommendation and I would be very loath to depart from that. Thank you very much. So that having been said, I put clause 30. Those in favor? Aye. Against? Um, clause, uh, part 5, clauses 32 to 43. I put those clauses. Sorry? Okay, hang on. So I have to put the editorial, correct? Okay, so, so please note, Madam, the editorial issue. So I put clauses 32 to 43. Those in favor? Against? Ayes have it. Um, there is an issue at as I move to part six, there is the issue at 52, I believe. So I'll put clauses 44 to 51. Those in favor? Against? Ayes have it. Clause 52. Yes, Mr. President. Similar issue, matter of a custodial sentence. Uh, so I propose that we treat with it in the same way and take it to minister. Well, you have your... your, your Undertaking, can I put it as, heavy, as high as, as high, that? As high as that, Mr. Yeah, President. Yeah, okay. We have your undertaking to look at the issue um, further. So I can put clauses 52 to 55 to complete part six. Those in favor? Against? Ayes have it. Um, part seven, clauses 56 to 77. Those in favor? Against? Um, I put the first schedule. There are some issues there, I believe. Yes, Mr. President. In paragraph 1, sub 2, sub A, it is proposed to insert next after the words member of, the words either house of. That's it for the first schedule. 
Yes, Mr. President. Okay. So I put the amendment to the first schedule as stated by the minister. Those in favor? Aye. Against? I put the... Mr. Chair, sure. before you put the schedule, on page 94, I'd ask a question. I raise a concern about the, the vacancy if the commissioner is not able to function. Sorry, Senator Scarfer, I never heard you. No, in, during the debate, the minister didn't... No, page 94? Number four, the first schedule, 94, page 94. I had a concern with the deputy commissioner indefinitely performing the duty for the commissioner if the commissioner is absent. And I raised the point that the commissioner could be out for quote-unquote long period for up to a year due to illness. And I would, and given the fact that the commissioner is appointed in a special situation with the governor general in consultation, whereas the deputy would be recruited by the commissioner. In fact, you could have a de facto commissioner, the deputy being de facto commissioner for a long period. So I, I raised the question that if she could have a similar provision to that in the Public Defender Act, for example, where you would act for a period, let's say three months, in the first instance, and there had to be some form of review, either the oversight with the, with the similar consultation. Because you don't want, if you have the commission the one being appointed with the confidence for integrity and all so on, and then this deputy that was recruited differently, being acting as a commissioner for a long period of time, and hence my initial proposal that if you had both appointed in the same manner, they would have solved this problem. But you and I know you could be the commissioner for a year and, and unfortunately something happens and you are out. You don't lose the position, but you cannot act in the position. And the deputy would be who didn't get the confidence directly from the three leaders. So I, when I look at the Public Defender Act and the Political Ombudsman Act, there is a provision that limits the initial period. Then you have to have something else for the extension. But this one could leave the deputy indefinitely. Minister, you would respond to that, please. Pardon me. Let me just take some guidance on that because it actually didn't form part of the note. My apologies. It didn't take note of that one. Um, so let me just take some guidance on it. I didn't find it the provision offensive, but I, I do take your point about uh, there being different ways to treat with the with this matter. See, Mr. President, why, Mr. No, no, Chair, we understand, sorry. We understand. No, what I'm just saying. Normally, you could say the deputy will act until. No, I, I get the picture. Yes. Th that's my recommendation, with some review. Similar, yeah, because... It may be wise to insert in the first instance a time frame Absolutely. to which that deputy commissioner would act Absolutely. and then it is evaluated thereafter. Absolutely. As, as I know in, in, in the field of education, for example, if you have an acting principal, it does not go on indefinitely. You are, you, are, you are appointed to act for a period of time. It is reviewed, new appointment form. So each time is like a break in the service. Because though you are the deputy, if you are not acting in accordance, then you could have somebody to fill that vacancy temporarily in acceptance by the three leaders, and then when the commissioner comes back, then you continue. Because the deputy is a substantive post with a separate job description. And the confidence among the three leaders was critical in getting the information commissioner. And you could have someone of lesser confidence carrying out the substantive post. So I support that. That's my recommendation, and I'm glad for the support in that context. Thanks, Mr. President. Just um, indicating that the, the thinking is that it, it, it would be unusual for there to be a situation where the, uh, this type of high-level appointment would 
would go with a vacancy for an extended period of time. That it is um, that to create a new uh, administrative process around might, might not be the best approach. That one would anticipate that the Governor General would act with some uh, expedition and that uh, it would have been deemed very clearly in everyone's interest that this type of action wouldn't. It's unusual for a senior position. We know acting in um, at general administrative roles can sometimes take place over an extended period, maybe too often. But at a senior level, it's actually quite unusual. So the thinking is that they would prefer to keep this structure, as has been put here, which is a, a, a usual structure. I hear about it being unusual, but it's not impossible. No, but I guess, I, I suspect that what the minister is trying to say is that it's a policy matter that has been determined. Oh, well, Mr. Chair, do you respect the minister didn't say that? The minister did not say that, so I'm responding to what was said. So I say it might be unusual, but not impossible. And let's be practical, the person could be ill for up to a year. Your nature of illness, a person who gets a minor stroke, for example, a stroke, doesn't mean you have to run the person from the position. You have time for the person to recover. It's pos possible. This is one position that has a seven-year appointment. So uh, 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 during year one, unfortunately, the person is ill. You want even, even the, the consideration is, so let's give it time to recover. So you can even up to a year. That's a practical situation that is, can happen. And the deputy might be asked to act for that entire year. So, so, so while it might be unusual, the law must seem to deal with all possibilities, not even the, un even the most unusual ones, once it is possible. And I'm sure the policy would not rule out that possibility. And hence, hence the, if it, the Public Defender Act understood that, hence the provision of three months in the first place. The Political Ambush Monetarium Act understood that, hence the provision for think, two to three months. So, so previous legislation anticipated that unusual behavior and put a provision to deal with it just in case it happens. And if we are no use and we're raising this data protection bill to even higher standard, given what we have just said in the debate, and we don't want somebody that was, you see, if, if, if both of them, what the critical thing, you know, is the consensus and confidence by the society. And the, the IC was appointed bearing that in mind. But you have a deputy that was recruited by the IC. <laughs> and, and that lies the cloud that I want to remove. Thank you very much, Senator Scarf. You know that you have made that point pellucidly um, once already. So you are making it again. So, but the minister wants to respond. Being a, being a teacher, Even I was learning that repetition helps <laughs> enhance learning. Even myself understand clearly what you are saying. Minister? Thank you, Mr. President. Mr. President, what I would do is simply say that we can put this to the minister as well, to the responsible minister. Um, it would just make it three clauses that she's considering, and I don't think it would do any harm to have that uh, treated that way. Thank you. Okay, thank you very much. So we, you have already taken on my amendment to the first schedule, so I take the first schedule as amended. Those in favor? Aye. Against? Second schedule? Those in favor? Aye. Against? Third schedule, those in favor? Aye. Against? Fourth. Fourth schedule, those in favor? Aye. Against? The fifth schedule, did you have something there? Well, I don't know why I think I had. There is an amendment? No, there is no amendment. Okay, so I take the fifth, sh fifth schedule. Those in favor? Aye. Against? I put the title and enacting clause. Those in favor? Aye. Against? The question is that I do report the bill as having passed committee stage with? All right, Mr. Chairman, before you do that, can I just ask a question? What did we finalize? I just went to consult on this section 30 and I just want to know what we we decide in the end. I'm so sorry. I undertook to raise it to the minister's attention so that she could take some technical advice. Because 
I was advised though that section 195 of the, res the resident, what is it now called, parish code act, um, have a specific provision that says where there's no fine, where there's no alternative, well, maybe I should read it, but it, there is a provision in section 195 that seems to cover the situation when there is no alternative. Well, if you, if somebody looks yes, for it for As me. a matter of interest, you could, you, you. This is a judicature, I'm so what, sorry. What the minister has done is undertaken to consult with the, the minister concerned, and yes. we had passed it okay. as it stands. Well, you so can have a look of, at. those of you who have an interest can. I think we can, can take comfort in section 195, though. But um, I will look, I'll look at it. You want any, anybody has a further interest can consult Senator Brown after the adjournment. Mr. Mr. Chairman. That's a, a fairly frivolous response, President. Um, I no, no, no. I won't hold it against you. No, it's a, we, okay. Since you consider it frivolous, read it for us. I don't. I wasn't being Senator Brown. You know, I would never be frivolous when it comes to you, of all people. Mr. Chairman, um, I. I got the benefit of a memory jog from the technocrats. And one of the reasons there's a difference in treatment of Section 30 versus Section 21. Are you going to, you're asking for the matter to be recommitted? No. Okay, so let me just, as a point of interest, take what Senator Bram has to say to us. And I'm not being frivolous with you, Senator. I wouldn't dis dismiss you. So let me hear what Senator Bram says, and then he might very well, he, what Senator Bram says might very well answer the query that you have. It says, where jurisdiction is given to any court to impose a fine, and no express provision is made as to the mode of enforcing payment of the same, payment may be enforced by the magistrate, ordering that in default of payment, forthwith, of such fine, the person on whom such fine is imposed shall suffer imprisonment <laughs> with or without hard labor for a period not exceeding six months. Where any fine has been imposed, the court at the time when such fine is imposed or at Senator any Motley, you remember I said to you that in my brain that there was another Where any fine has been imposed the court at the time when such fine is imposed or at any time thereafter may allow time for payment, etc. I don't think I need to read that. But that answers the question. So there is, a, there is an implicit, there is an implied alternative. No, sir? Okay, so we're good to go. Senator Morgan, you wanted to say something. There is really not much need, but I just want to... So not much need? Yes. The reason why the committee suggested that there not be a custodial sentence outlined in the law for no but senator you hear what you hear what there is an implied which is why i said to you sentence. that there was no need consult him after no that's fine the question is that i do report the bill as having passed committee stage with three amendments those in favor Against? I do report the bill as having passed committee stage with three amendments. Minister? Mr. President, I ask for third reading of the bill. Thank you, Madam. The question is that the bill be read for a third time. <laughs> Those in favor? Aye. Against? Bill entitled an act to protect the privacy of certain data and for connected matters read a third time Good in past. So Madam Clark, you just read the bill for a third time, right? Eh? 
Yeah, so the question is that the bill be read for a third time. Those in favor? Aye. Against? Just go again, please. A bill entitled An Act to Protect the Privacy of Certain Data and for Connected Matters, read a third time and passed. Thank you, Madam Clark. Sure. Minister? Yeah, I'm sorry. It's just that. Actually. Mr. President, thank you very much. Uh, it is not intended to do any further business today, so I ask that the Senate be adjourned for a date to be fixed. Thank you very much, Minister. Um, thank you very much, members of the technical team who have spent the day with us. Um, I hope you enjoyed the day's proceedings. And I keep saying that I'm going to offer you lunch, but then I, I keep forgetting. So thank you very much, and thanks to all of you for participating in a day that can be described as emotional. Um, so the question is the Senate be adjourned for a date to be fixed. Those in favor? Against? This Honorable Senate stands adjourned. <laughs>